I'd like to present to you Catherine Kangany, known to us at JHSM as Katie. She has been our executive director since 2018. Previously, she was a tenured associate professor of history at the University of Notre Dame. She received her PhD from the University of Michigan. The stars were aligned almost five years ago when Dr. Kangany was hoping to work community history, and we were searching for an executive director. We feel so fortunate to have her at the helm of our organization. So please, Katie, tell us about this very interesting new information that you have discovered. Thank you, Jeannie, and thank you all for being here. I know we have some uh, descendants of some of the people we're gonna be talking about tonight, which is very exciting. Um, so I I'm so glad to be celebrating Jewish American Heritage Month with all of you. We're gonna talk about a forgotten moment in Detroit's Jewish history that's interesting and a bit sensational, but it's also a testament to the community's forebears and th their fortitude. And I just happened to stumble upon this story just by reading through old issues of Detroit's newspapers. I picked a year, then I picked a month, um, then I picked an issue, and then the story just fell into my lap. And to my knowledge, um, this incident has not appeared in any publication, so it's brand new historical research. And we're sharing it specifically tonight because the kosher meat riot was happening 113 years ago tonight. And you'll see as we go along that this history is not fully reconstructed yet, and hopefully it can be fully reconstructed. Hopefully the source base will allow for that. Um, but at a minimum, even in this draft version, you'll get an insider's look in how historians do history. And to, um, to see the full version, I'm gonna uh, share my screen for just a moment. Um, one moment. We will um, invite you to come to an exhibit that we are gonna open at the Detroit Historical Museum in April of 2024, which will run through July, called In the Neighborhood, Every, Everyday Life on Hastings Street, which is the first Jewish neighborhood in Detroit. And part of that exhibit will feature this research. So come in April, 2024 and see the whole thing. Okay, on a Sunday night in May, 1910, violence erupted in Detroit's Hastings Street neighborhood. Known then as part of the ghetto, this neighborhood stretched from Clinton Street in the south, north to Alfred Street, east to Rivard, and west to St. Antoine, where Lafayette Park and uh, Eastern Market are today. The neighborhood's thoroughfare was Hastings Street. And according to one astonished eyewitness, Detroit's ghetto is in the throes of a meat strike, a real bitter fighting meat strike and the nondescript kosher butcher shops along Hastings Street are practically closed up while shifting throngs of excited shawl covered belligerent women are doing picket duty and occasionally making a raid on some luckless purchaser of meat, bearing her into the boycott by real strenuous measures. The fighting women swoop down upon the shopper. as She emerges from the shop, tear the forbidden meat from her hands, throw it on the sidewalk, pour kerosene upon it, effectively putting it out of commission as an article of diet. The scene the eyewitness noted cast real policemen struggling with a real mob. Hastings Street presents a spectacle of a warlike camp. Now you may be familiar with Hastings Street in the 1940s when it was predominantly a black neighborhood, but in this earlier period, um, although there were black residents, this was overwhelmingly where Detroit's recent and poor European immigrants lived. And among their number in 1910 were about 10,000 Jews. And every year, thousands more were settling there. In fact, by 1927, Detroit's Jewish population would be seven and a half times larger at 75,000 people, the sixth largest concentration in the US. And as an aside, um, you'll see this, is, this was not a very well photographed neighborhood in this time period. And often the photographs that we do have like these here, the people and the culture are exoticized. So you see this, their foreignness was emphasized by the photographer who was an outsider. So some of those photos then were printed in local newspapers where readers, also outsiders, would view them as curiosities. In some cases, the original photographs themselves seem to be gone, so we're left with these grainy published versions. But even with these shortcomings, these, these photos are invaluable. 
So Hastings Street was not generally where Detroit's German American Jews who had arrived in the mid 19th century were living by 1910. There were about 2000 of them. And over time, as they Americanized, um, they dropped traditional practices like keeping kosher. They moved up the economic ladder and they moved to more fashionable neighborhoods for the North like Boston Edison. And that's where the who's who of Detroit in 1910, including Henry Ford, um, they lived in Boston Edison, as did Rabbi Leo M. Franklin, rabbi of Detroit's first synagogue, Temple Bethel, and his congregants were over overwhelmingly of German extraction. By contrast, Hastings Street Jews generally hailed from Eastern Europe and most from the Russian Empire, and they had begun to arrive in Detroit 30 years earlier in 1881. They had been solidly middle class in their homelands, but because of systemic persecution and discrimination, they had left to start over in the United States with very little. And so in Detroit, they often lived in desperate conditions, overcrowding, poor sanitation, poverty, illness, misery. But the silver lining of Hastings Street in all its diversity was that it was, it was surprisingly easy for its inhabitants to continue to practice their cultural and religious traditions communally. So in the case of its Eastern European Jewish residents, that meant they continued to speak Yiddish everywhere. Um, they continued to practice Orthodox Judaism. They went to synagogue with people who hailed from the same homeland and in some cases from the same hometown. And they continued to keep kosher following the dietary restrictions laid out in the biblical books of Vayikra, Shemot, and Devarim. The production of kosher meat, of course, begins with ritual slaughterers. And then, as now, they train extensively using particular knives and particular techniques so that the animals are killed quickly and precisely according to Jewish law. The muscles and the organs, especially the lungs, are then inspected for injuries and abnormalities. In the early 20th century, only 65% of ritually slaughtered cattle passed these tests. And because generally speaking, the hindquarters of the animals were not used for kosher meat, only about a third of the meat on any given carcass might be certified. So after a carcass is declared kosher, a seal bearing the signature of the ritual slaughterer and also the date of the slaughter um, are affixed to the meat and then it's prepped for sale and delivered to the kosher butchers. Today, kosher meat is sold fully processed, but in the early 20th century, the final stage of the protocol, the koshering, which uh, means fully draining the blood and then soaking and salting the meat, that happened at home after sale, and that was labor done by women. Important for our purposes, no more than 72 hours can elapse between slaughter and koshering, because after 72 hours, the blood becomes too congealed to extract. Removing blood, bones, sinews, and forbidden fats reduces the meat by another 15%. So even after a perfect ritual slaughtering of a healthy cow or steer, nearly 80% of the meat is unfit for observant Jews. Okay, so in Detroit in 1910, there were almost 30 kosher butchers, which sounds like a lot, <laughs> but in New York City in 1910, there were 600. <laughs> But whether or not you were in New York or Detroit, butchers would then um, visit the slaughterhouses in the afternoons, select their meats, chop them into the various cuts, and then sell them the following morning. So working around Shabbat, Saturday nights, Sundays, and Tuesdays were the Jewish community's biggest meat shopping days. When Hastings Street erupted in violence on Sunday, May 8, 1910, at issue was the price of kosher beef. Now, kosher beef is always more expensive than non, right? It has to be because you're paying for the expertise of the slaughter and the quality of the meat and its certification. So the customary upcharge was not the issue, but the sudden rake height was. Detroit's working class Jews had been accustomed to paying six to eight cents per pound for kosher beef six to eight cents for the cheapest cuts, flank and chuck. Now those same cuts were suddenly costing between 14 and 18 cents per pound. So almost two and a half times what they had been accustomed to paying. So that would be like those cuts, which today run from six to $8 per pound, suddenly costing up to $18 per pound. So you, you can see, right, that this is an, an exorbitant change. Um, it's a lot of money, especially when you've got a lot of mouths to feed and not many resources to feed them with. And for most, buying non-kosher meat was unthinkable. 
The people who noticed this sudden price increase first and who were the most upset about it were the Jewish women of Hastings Street. When a befuddled newspaper reporter asked a Jewish man why the women who had no voting rights in 1910 and thus were not recognized as legitimate political actors, why the women were organizing this economic resistance and not the men, the interviewee responded, quote, because that's their business. They buy the meat. Do you think I would go into a butcher shop? I should say not. Maybe the butcher would sell me a lung for a flank state. How do I know? But because they did the shopping and the cooking, the women had the food knowledge. They knew what to buy and where, they knew how to prepare it, and they knew how much it should cost. And they were also new enough to American gender and social conventions to feel perfectly within their rights and their domain to express, express their outrage publicly. Now, as you might expect, because of their actions and because of the biases of the recorders, their names have not come down to us, with one exception. We know the lead organizer was Mrs. Harry Posner, Rebecca Posner, or Becca, as she was called in the 1910 census. She was just 20 years old, and she could not read or write, but she was fluent in at least two languages and probably more. Born in Russia, she had emigrated to the US in 1905, settling first in Philadelphia. Incredibly, in Philadelphia, she had successfully led 300 girls from the American Cigar Company's factory in a strike. And she was 17 when she did that. According to the Detroit News, Rebecca Posner, quote, thought the factory superintendent imposed on the workers, and in three days, she had the boss beaten to a standstill. He was fired and the girls returned to work. And then from the same article, um, she's a wonder, whispered her husband by her side during Detroit's kosher meat riot. I married her three years ago in Philadelphia. She is a wonder. She makes everybody toe the mark. Her husband was 23 and working as a tinsmith in the Detroit stove works. Becca Posner told the press, quote, yes, I'm the lead of the strikers and I'm going to keep the fight up until we can get living prices. So it's interesting that she uses the word strikers and you'll see as we go on that she uses it repeatedly um, because what happened in Detroit was not actually a strike. As we will see, it was a boycott that turned into a riot, but certainly that, that striker word, that vocabulary uh, was what she was doing in Philadelphia. And so that was her frame of reference. The reporter interviewing her in Detroit then asked for her picture and she replied that she was too busy. And so she handed her house keys to her husband and told him to go retrieve the photograph, and he did. So this is the photo that we have of Mrs. Harry Posner, of Rebecca Posner from the paper. Rebecca Posner and the other angry women soon formed a committee. And on Sunday, May 1st, so this is a week before the violence, um, that committee called a community-wide meeting featuring a high-profile speaker, a New Yorker by the name of Baruch Charney Vladek. Vladik was a recent Russian emigre, a high profile um, labor leader, and at 24, he was a representative of the Jewish Agitation Bureau. The Jewish Agitation Bureau was a clearinghouse for Yiddish language uh, branches of the Socialist Party. And in time, it would become the Jewish Socialist Federation with a presence in 30 states. But in 1910, its purpose was simply and exactly what Detroit sought furnishing prominent Yiddish speaking socialists to help locals organize around issues of labor and economy. The New York connection of course is logical. In 1910, New York City had and still has the largest concentration of Jews in the US. Many of Detroit's Jews came to the US through New York, whether living there first or simply passing through. Many had friends and family there. And each week Detroit received copies of New York's Yiddish language newspapers, including most famously the Forward, which is still in press today and which Vladek would go on to edit beginning in 1916. But back in Detroit in 1910, Vladek was the program at that May 1st community meeting, and his speech has not survived, but in addition to galvanizing the crowd, he probably did a couple of things. First, he probably linked what was going on in Detroit with other Jewish communities across the United States, because everyone was experiencing rapid inflation on kosher meat. In Indianapolis that January, Jewish families boycotted four kosher butcher shops after the meat jumped to 14 cents per pound. Two months later, a woman in Baltimore was arrested for seizing a package of kosher meat from a local delivery boy and throwing it in the street. 
In St. Louis in late March, 42 out of 46 kosher meat shops, that's 91% closed, unable to meet the boycotters' demands to return to 12 cent beef. In New York and New Jersey in April, just before Pesach, 100,000 families banned kosher meat after threatening butchers with clubs and hat pins. In the weeks ahead, Cincinnati and Providence, Rhode Island would also experience boycotts and riots. Now, because they subscribed to the New York papers, Jewish Detroiters undoubtedly knew all of this. But to have their predicament linked with those of so many other communities manifested in the presence of Vladik himself well, that would have been powerful and persuasive, and it would have legitimized their anger and catalyzed their desire to fight back. Second, Vladek undoubtedly would have talked about what happened in New York eight years earlier, the 1902 kosher meat riot, the first, the largest, and the most violent of the kosher meat boycotts that rocked American Jewish communities. That year, New York's Jewish community railed against kosher meat's coordinated jump from 12 cents to 18 cents per pound. So this was a smaller rate hike um, than what Detroit would experience uh, eight years later. New York's 1902 meat riot was the direct result of the actions of the Gilded Age robber barons, the wealthy businessmen who dominated various sectors of the American economy, including railroads, oil, steel, and meat. Through monopolies and trusts, which were technically illegal, um, but Congress generally didn't regulate them, the robber barons then manipulated prices across their industries. And because these industries were linked, it was virtually impossible for competition to break in and virtually impossible for consumers to find cheaper alternatives. In 1902, five robber barons created a conglomerate of five of the nation's largest meat packing firms called the National Packing Company, but informally known as the Beef Trust. Mostly the Beef Trust operated out of Chicago because with the invention in 1875 of refrigerated rail cars, it was now possible to slaughter in one city and sell in another. And in 1902, the Beef Trust had a monopoly on the New York market. Like for many Eastern cities, two thirds of New York's beef came from the cattle raised in the American Southwest and the Far West, which was then sold and slaughtered in Chicago. Chicago's Union Stockyards, which you see here, processed more meat than any other place on earth. As Scott Seligman has shown, behind closed doors, the Beef Trust cooperated to depress the prices they paid for cattle, pressure the railroads for kickbacks and shipping fees, and manipulate the nation's supply of beef and other commodities. So that meant that beef butchered in Chicago could be sold more cheaply in Manhattan than locally slaughtered cattle. Cheaper, but not fresher. Western dressed meat might sit in a Chicago slaughterhouse cooler for three to four days before transport. Then it took three more days to reach the East Coast where it might sit in a New Jersey storage locker for a week or more before being taken across the Hudson River for final sale. Sometimes that meat was treated with boric acid, a preservative to prolong its shelf life. The alternative to Western dressed beef was city dressed beef, the other third of New York's meat market. It was slaughtered locally, but because of the beef trust's underhanded tactics, cost two to four cents per pound more. Fancy New York hotels demanded this fresher variety, and because of Jewish Dietary Law's 72-hour uh, rule, so too did those who kept kosher. So at best, observant Jews in New York had access to just one third of the meat market. Chicago meat was off the table. While anxious to increase its profits, in 1902, the Beef Trust raised its wholesale rates by 50%, with beef carcass prices climbing from seven to 10 and a half cents per pound. The butchers, of course, passed on the rate hike to the consumers. The consumers blamed the butchers. The butchers blamed the Beef Trust. The Beef Trust blamed a cattle shortage, but that was a lie. The truth was there were plenty of cattle. It's just that the Beef Trust controlled cattle prices too. President Theodore Roosevelt, who was known as the Trust Buster, went after the National Packing Company in 1902, directing the filing of simultaneous lawsuits against the five firms. But the court battle was slow and the prices remained high. In response, New York consumers switched protein sources, turning to poultry, veal, mutton, lamb, and eggs. 
Detroit would try this also, but the Beef Trust owned many of those slaughterhouses and refrigerated rail cars for those industries too. And in cases where it didn't, it deliberately stockpiled the food to dry up the supply. The prices on all protein sources soared. Many non-kosher butchers who had been using West dress, excuse me, Western dressed beef now turned to city dressed beef, putting extra pressure on that limited and already more expensive supply. So in response to that new and extra competition at this higher price point, New York's Jewish women turned first to boycotts and then to riots that escalated in violence. And after three weeks of unrest, the battle was over. Meat prices declined. The women had won. But despite the victorious battle, the war against the Beef Trust was still raging. And in the years that followed, various meat riots, many in the Jewish community, broke out over these exact same issues. There were kosher meat riots in Cleveland in 1906, Baltimore in 1907, just about everywhere in 1910, because the Beef Trust would not be shut down for good until 1912. But the blueprint, um, the model for how to respond to these riots came straight out of 1902 New York. First, demand a return to six or eight cent beef. If that fails, boycott beef. Then take to the streets and have your most compelling uh, public speakers rail against the rate hike. At all costs, enforce the boycott, target individuals who don't apply. That means threatening and physically assaulting customers and butchers and butchers' wives with fists, clubs, and hat pins. Destroy or otherwise make inedible any beef that you find. Overturn delivery wagons and throw the meat into the mud. Raid butcher shops and fling the meat on the floor. Rip purchases from customers' hands and douse the meat with kerosene. Force the butcher shops to close. Smash the windows of those still doing business. And most importantly, band together to open a co-op kosher meat shop that is contract bound to sell beef at the old prices. And this 1902 template is exactly what the Hastings Street women did. Following a mass meeting on Sunday afternoon, May 8th, the community descended on Hastings Street at about 7.30 PM, a busy shopping time. And here's what the Detroit Free Press had to say. And as I read this, note how closely they hewed to that New York model. Quote, more than a thousand irate Jewish housewives, some armed with cans of kerosene, raided the butcher shops of the neighborhood at sundown. They advanced upon the butchers, scattered the precious meats upon the floor, and harassed the proprietors until every shop on Hastings Street between Montcalm and Adelaide Streets was closed tight. Women rushed into the Hastings Street butcher shop of Joseph Lansky, dragged the meat from the counter, and some even pushed their ways to the blocks where the clerks were at work, and ultimately the employees were forced to retreat. Kerosene flew in the place, and meat, which last week was advanced to 16 cents a pound, was ruthlessly ruined. Well, by this time, the mob had swelled to fill four blocks on Hastings Street. Um, and I'll just pause here to say that this is the only published photo that exists of the riot itself, um, as grainy as it is. Th this is a remarkable uh, photograph here. Once Lansky's store was decimated, it turned its efforts to smaller butcher shops, defiling meat and breaking windows. Soon police officers from several stations were on the scene trying to force the rioters further up Hastings Street. For more than an hour, the scuffling continued. And even after comparative peace had been restored, some of the more bitter men gathered in front of the meat stores and resumed their efforts to incite the crowd by making speeches about freedom and planning cooperative meat shops. At a later point during the riots, a butcher's wife made the mistake of laughing out loud at one of the orators. One of the women boycotters called out to the butcher's wife saying, ah, she laughs while our blood is being spilled in the streets. Well, the crowd then rushed at the butcher's wife who sought refuge in her husband's shop. Only the prompt interference of the police prevented her husband from punching the head of a young man who tried to sick the fighting women on his wife. Well, despite whatever Vladek might have said about the larger forces at work in America's beef supply, those caught up in local beef fever tended to be short-sighted about the problems and their solutions. As Scott Seligman argues for New York in 1902, quote, although the true villains in the drama were mostly Gentile businessmen located hundreds of miles away, 
the local scene pitted Jew against Jew, housewives against butchers, butchers against wholesalers, the secular against the Orthodox, Eastern Europeans against Germans, honest rabbis against corrupt ones. It also exacerbated other frictions, such as those between the Jewish community and the police. It was as true in Detroit as it was in New York. As the weekdays ticked by, the violence continued. On Monday morning, May 9th, Abraham Hendon's butcher shop on Hastings Street was targeted. The purchases of two boycott breakers were given the kerosene treatment. Then the mob descended on Harris Goldberg's Hastings Street restaurant, where it confronted him for having kosher beef on the menu. Under pressure, Goldberg agreed to buy no more after running through his stock. On Tuesday morning, May 10th, a Detroit Times journalist reported on the spectacle he witnessed, writing, quote, three of the boycotting women, each with a babe held in her left arm, attacked a man whom they accused of purchasing meat. The man was Abraham Cohen, who ran a shoe repair shop on Hastings Street. The women descended on his store, carefully transforming their shawls into baby carriers before starting what the reporter called a hot argument in Yiddish with the man. He ordered them out and then suddenly they attacked him, forcing him out of his own shop to the sidewalk and showering blows on his face and head. Cohen made no attempt to fight back. As simple protests devolved into battery and property damage, Detroit's German-American Jews, the ones who generally lived beyond Hastings Street and who were less observant, made sure the press knew they were not involved. You'll not find an American Jew mixed up in any of these brawls, said one man. Some of the American Jews are boycotting the meat markets, but they are not fighting about it. These Russian Jews come over here and three months after they arrive, they wanna run the country. If they don't wanna pay the prices for meat, they insist that nobody else will be allowed to. These women who are leading the fights live in homes that are filthy, but instead of doing their housework, they are here on the streets causing trouble for others. Well, in point of fact, the newspaper reporter interviewing Rebecca Posner made a show of inspecting her residence, the lower floor of a, uh, of a home on St. Antoine Street and affirming, quote, the house was in disorderly condition. <laughs> But the more damning association for the Jewish community was socialism. As a reporter related, quote, wealthy Jews, and that's a euphemism for German American Jews, wealthy Jews attribute the disturbance to the workings of Jewish socialists who came to this country recently from Russia. But interestingly, the boycotters were also quick to distance themselves from, from socialism. Rebecca Posner insisted, socialists, I don't know what they are. We're not socialists. We're simply trying to get decent prices so that we can live. I'm not an agitator, but I am going to help win this strike. Nobody wanted to be associated publicly with socialism. But within the neighborhood was another thing. The Jewish Agitation Bureau privately picked up all the assembly and printing costs incurred for the several mass meetings held in the community to try to make peace. On Tuesday, May 10th, flyers were distributed to announce a gathering that night. And in the interest of fairness, the format was designed to allow each side to have its say. The 800 attendees were hopeful for some sort of compromise, um, but the reality proved what one reporter called a near riot. Now you've probably noticed that so far nothing has been said about religious authority and that has been a challenging piece to reconstruct. Um, we know that Rabbi Judah Levin, who was a respected problem solver in the community and purportedly an architect of Detroit's kosher meat system, he had been expected to chair this meeting on May 10th, um, but he didn't, he, he was not in attendance and that absence exacerbated the room's tensions. But what role he might have had behind the scenes in trying to negotiate this still remains to be determined. But according to an eyewitness, at the meeting, the 10 butchers in, uh, in attendance were hissed and hooted down each time they tried to talk, while avowed socialist exhorters harangued the crowd. In the end, the angry audience surged over chairs into the aisles and right up to the speaker stand, pressing in on those who attempted to address them while the whole crowd hissed and groaned and shouted. Police presence saved the butchers from violence, but not for long. In the wee hours of Wednesday morning, May 11th, a band of unidentified men attacked a kosher meat wagon owned by butcher Benjamin Krakowski. Krakowski was known for being the first to offer home delivery. The assailant stopped the wagon, threw a bag over the driver's head, and began tossing $24 worth of beef into the street, 
where it was trampled or strung up on telegraph wires. When the dust cleared, everybody pointed the finger at somebody else. The kosher butchers declared the rioters did it, even though most of the rioters were women and these assailants were clearly men. Krakowski's son blamed the other kosher, kosher butchers, who he felt were envious of his father's wealthier clientele, who lived outside of Hastings Street and were not participating in the boycott. In retaliation, Krakowski's son and a couple of his friends then attacked the driver of another kosher butcher who was on his way to a slaughterhouse to pick up some calves. Whoever had attacked Krakowski's wagon, now the butchers were turning on themselves. Well, the next day, Krakowski found himself in police court making a formal complaint about his ruined kosher meat. The court's justice was Edward J. Jeffries, a left-leaning man known for his clemency and fairness, especially to the city's immigrant poor. And in an amazing twist of fate, three decades later, in 1944, his son, Detroit Mayor Edward J. Jeffries Jr., would propose tearing down the Hastings Street neighborhood after it had become a predominantly Black space. Five years after his proposal in 1949, the demolition began displacing 100,000 Black Detroiters and the Jeffries Freeway I-96 was named in the mayor's honor. But back in 1910, the elder Jeffries talked with butcher Benjamin Krakowski and he was curious about this soiled meat. Why don't you just wash it off? The judge asked. It's no good anymore, Krakowski replied. It's come into contact with mud and it can't be used. Now, it's easy to imagine many justices mocking the complaint right out of court, but Jeffries carefully considered on what grounds he could issue a warrant for the perpetrator's arrest. After consulting with a prosecuting attorney, he settled on malicious injury to property. Unfortunately for Krakowski, boycotters then stormed the, the courtroom, assuring Jeffries that the uprising would be settled in two days. If a warrant were issued now, they warned, it would only serve to stir up all the bitterness and the ill feeling again. Justice Jeffries decided to hold the matter in abeyance until Friday to see how the events played out. Well, all along Detroit's kosher butchers were insisting that they were not making money, even at beef's higher prices, but nobody was listening. After days of being prevented from trying to explain Detroit's fluctuating meat market, on Wednesday afternoon, at least six of Detroit's kosher butchers gathered in Joe Rakofsky's kosher meat shop on Hastings Street, where Rakofsky offered, for the benefit of the press, a graphic demonstration. He produced his bills of sale from the Sullivan Beef Company, a local slaughterhouse, to prove he was paying 11 and a half cents a pound on whole carcasses of beef. Up to his butcher's block, he hauled a 16 pound shoulder of beef that had cost him $1.92. He then divvied it up to illustrate the butcher's profit and loss. When the cutting was done, he was left with four and a half pounds of 18 cent meat, almost three pounds of 15 cent meat, two and a half pounds of 13 cent meat, and six pounds of bone. The different grades of meat would bring in only $1.55 leaving him with a deficit of 37 cents. That's an honest, wide open illustration of our claims, Rakowski told a reporter. We tell them we're losing money. They jeer and say, why don't you close up your shops then? But we have our investment here and we have to take the, the spells of high wholesale prices and figure on making up the difference later when the prices fall. Kosher butcher Charlie Prague had different ideas. We're going to hold a meeting, he announced, but we're going to discuss vastly different things than surrender the, to the socialistic mob that's stirring up all of this trouble. We are going to consult with Mayor Philip Breitmeyer and Police Commissioner Frank Krull and ask as taxpayers that we be allowed to operate our shops without interference from these socialists. We're going to ask that those who want to buy meat from us will also receive protection. And if the city won't furnish, furnish protection, we will take the law into our own hands. We are about 30 strong, and if we can't get police protection, we will carry the war into the camp of these socialist disturbers, and we will clean them out. With or without police protection, by Wednesday night, a compromise was in the works. Workmen's Circle, a Jewish mutual aid organization that became influential in the labor movement, called for another mass meeting. In an interview with the press, one of its spokesmen explained that the Workman Circle mission, uh, what, the, what the Workman Circle mission was, but hastened to add that it was socialistic, but not the regular socialist body. 
and 800 community members also turned out for this meeting. Well, out of the Workman Circle meeting came the solution that would end the boycott and the riot, just as Vladek would have predicted and advised, a cooperative kosher meat market. The press reported that the announcement came from a group of men who lent their energies to applauding the spirit of the fighting Hebrew women. Two fathers and two sons already had collectively raised $20,000 to finance 10 co-op meat shops. Well, the plan, plan sounded too good to be true. Um, they said that kosher meat would be purchased directly from the meat packers and sold at cost, ranging from 10 to 14 cents per pound, still more than Detroiters had been paying originally, but down from that high of 18 cents. And they even found a willing kosher butcher, a man by the name of Abraham Bordeloff, who agreed on penalty of forfeiting his shop to sign a contract promising not to raise prices, not even a quarter of a cent, before January 1st, 1911. Initially, there was some difficulty securing a location for Bordeloff's shop. The other kosher butchers somehow interfered with the first site, preventing it from opening. But a new storefront was soon secured, just in time for sales to begin at 4 a.m. on Friday, May 13th. The grand opening was a madhouse. Four policemen were on hand to force the women shoppers into two orderly lines, one each direction from the shop's front door. Only five customers were permitted to enter the shop at a time. In the words of one reporter, quote, scores of men st stood complacently by, figuratively patting one another on the backs over the victory over the butchers. By 8 a.m., Bordeloff had to make an emergency run back to a local slaughterhouse to find and slaughter more animals. By noon, all 2,200 pounds of meat from the eight cows and 11 calves Bordeloff had scrounged to stock the shop had all been sold. For the most part, customers were happy, although Bordeloff was not cutting the bones out of the meat before weighing it, as the other kosher butchers did. But ultimately, the price was the thing. And in the frenzy of sales, the poor butcher could not calculate whether he had made or lost money. And significantly, he would not divulge where his meat had come from. Rebecca Posner told, uh, was triumphant when she told the press, quote, we've got them beaten now and they know it. We are getting all the restaurant keepers to sign an agreement to buy their meat from the cooperative shop. The other dealers can go out of business if they want to. Detroit's other kosher butcher shops remained closed, but they weren't out of business. Joe Rakowski, who had memorably carved up that beef shoulder to show his profit and loss, had seven fronts of cattle for sale that morning, but he would not sell. He told a Times journalist, quote, we will open on Saturday night and sell steer beef at the regular prices. But today we all stay closed. We want everybody, poor customers and good customers, to buy their meat at the striker shop today. We want them to see what kind of meat they are getting for 10, 12, and 14 cents a pound. It is the meat of old milk cows, the kind that is usually used only for sausage. The cows cost as low as five cents a pound on the hoof. Dressed and slaughtered, they can be bought from seven to nine cents a pound. It is not good meat, but the strikers are buying it now as chuck, flank, and shoulder steak and are satisfied because they are getting it for 10, 12, and 14 cents. Well, Rakowski's math was spot on. Under pressure from a local journalist, Abraham Bordeloff admitted to selling cow meat, not steer meat, which he had purchased at an average cost of 10 cents per pound. That price point left little room for his own labor and wages. But as Rakowski put it, the other kosher butchers were, quote, satisfied to have Bordeloff sell all of that that he wants to. The boycotters, however, envisioned a different outcome. They gave an ultimatum to the other kosher butchers, announcing that unless they all agreed to sell meat at 10, 12, and 14 cents per pound, like Bordeloff, they would open several additional co-ops and put the holdouts out of business. So that the competitors would demonstrate their good faith in this new venture, the boycotters then demanded a $50 payment from each kosher butcher. That's $1,100 they want to collect before they move on to some other town and start a disturbance, said Rakowski with a grin. They'll never get $50 from any butcher, and no butcher is going to want to deal with a committee. Well, they did at least get one other butcher to open a co-op. Co uh, Jacob Cohen would hang out his shingle on Hastings Street the following week. As Friday's frantic sales ground to a halt and the community returned home, relieved, triumphant, and ready to prepare again for Shabbat, 
Abraham Bordeloff, the first co-op butcher, must have felt great anxiety. He had sourced his first day meat at great personal effort. He was extremely worried about maintaining the supply at the required price point. But while Bordeloff fretted silently, his co-op partner, Abraham Markovitz, boasted to a reporter, I can get all the meat they want and can sell it at 10, 12, and 14 cents and keep in business. Rebecca Posner undoubtedly was thrilled with that outcome, but although she may have won the battle, without federal intervention, she could not possibly win the war. Markovitz did not disclose how he could possibly achieve what no other coach or butcher anywhere in the United States could achieve for long. But the group of Jewish men working behind the scenes to broker the co-op deal made no bones about the supply lines. Bordeloff's meat would come from Chicago. Thank you. And I'll just, uh, as just a reminder, if you'd like to learn more about this research, please come to our exhibit at the Detroit Historical Museum, which opens in April of 2024 called In the Neighborhood. Thank you. So this is Jeannie. Are you hearing me? Okay. Thank you, Katie, that was so interesting. I was thinking that when on earth are we ever able to get 100, 800 to 1,000 Jewish people to do anything here in Detroit? And certainly this was a, a violent thing they were doing, but a very unusual and an unknown story up until now. Um, I, I wonder if you would expand a little bit on the police response, hmm. what you were able to find out from the police response. And, and we will be looking in the chat to see what other questions come up in the meantime. So please put your questions in the chat. So the um, the big mass meeting of 800 people where where the 10 butchers were trying to explain their profit and loss, that was, uh, that was a very contentious meeting and Detroit police sent out uh, a lieutenant and then a squad of, I think, 10 officers to keep the peace in the meeting. And that's what, what pre prevented uh, any violence from coming to the butchers themselves. But of course, when the police were not on the scene later that night and then the days that followed, that's when the, when the violence was breaking out. Um, but certainly like we saw in the 1902 uh, riot in New York, this incident put the Jewish community on the Detroit police forces radar. And I, I have, um, I've not seen evidence yet of violence between officers and members of the Jewish community. That's something that I'll be looking at in the police court records. Um, but, but certainly the, um, the Detroit police force was very aware of what was going on in Hastings Street, Hastings Street for, for better or for worse. Um, and so there's certainly more work to be done there. Okay, and someone in the chat has asked about the Jewish Agitation Bureau. Yeah, uh, Gail, thank you for that question. Name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gail, I know, I know you have joked about wanting to make T-shirts uh, with that phrase on it, and I, I would completely buy one. Um, so the Jewish Agitation Bureau was the was the sort of forerunner to the Socialist Federation. Um, there were little chapters eventually in 30 states, but in this period, it really was uh, based out of New York. This was a um, kind of a clearinghouse for um, all kinds of issues related to labor and economy across the US. And so if there was any sort of incident uh, in, the, in the Jewish community anywhere in the US that um, really would have benefited from the, um, the perspective and the experience of what had been going on in New York, they would send out a representative. And so that's what, um, what why Vladek turns up in Detroit and why he's, he's um, kind, of, uh, kind of overseeing the proceedings and also giving them the model. But it, so in this period, it's, it's um, a very loose set of affiliations, but eventually it coalesces into the Socialist Federation. And there, before I ask one of the questions in the chat, it, it's so interesting to me how the, the word socialism or socialist during various periods of history are, is, is, a, is a very bad word. And yes. in other times it's not as bad. Can, can you talk a little bit about why it was unlikely that these people were socialists? Sure. Um, so, so I think there are several definitions of 
of socialist floating around in this in this incident and it sort of ranges from you know someone who might be leaning left a little bit left on issues of labor and, and economy to somebody who might be participating in those more formal structures like uh, the Jewish Agitation Bureau, Workmen's uh, Circle, et cetera. Um, so I think there's a range of definitions there, but certainly as, um, as the community was trying to fit in um, to some degree Americanize, to some degree acculturate, they didn't want to be perceived in any way that might threaten um, threaten what what WASP Americans um, kind of thought about uh, about labor, about economy, and about socialism. So it's a very delicate balance. So I think that's why we see this um, absolute. Uh, absolute disdain for, for socialism and kind of um, keeping it at an arm's length in the secular press, despite what we see happening with Vladek and who's paying for these, uh, for these meetings, who's um, giving them the blueprint for how to respond. So there's, there's a little bit of um, smoke and mirrors going on there. I know there are some people on this call who are related to butchers and uh, yes. one of the questions are how many of these butchers that you talked about um, maybe still around or what butchers remained on on Hastings Street because so could you uh, talk about that a little bit? Sure I know there are uh, a number of descendants of Benjamin Krakowski the one whose wagon was overturned the, the guy who started the home delivery service. Uh, I know a number of, uh, of them are on this call which is very exciting. Um, uh, so, so yes, there are, there are still descendants around, which is very cool. And we're very glad to have them on the call. Um, it's, I think someone had a comment that they believed that you, um, re referred to the immigrants as middle class, and they were under the impression that Jews in Russia were mostly lived in poverty. So could you straighten yeah, that? Yeah, sure. So so yeah, that's just that's just the perspective of change over time there. Um, that certainly as the pogroms uh, were were in full swing, right? By by the time they're immigrating, they have very little. Um, but but um, certainly in the periods before that had more means. So they were coming to the US with very, very little. And there's a really good question here too, which is one that, that I also was thinking of. Um, Katie is known for her scholarship and all of her various administrative skills, um, but one of the things she really does well is research. And as she mentioned at the beginning of this uh, talk, this sort of fell into her lap in a way um, because of looking for material for our exhibit that's coming up in a year and looking at these years. But um, they, someone has asked, um, how, have, what records have you looked at? What records do you plan on looking at? What is the process that you've gone through and that you probably will continue to go through to expand on this particular very new found story? That's a great question. So it started with the newspaper coverage because I just happened to come across it. Um, and then from there went to, you know, the kinds of records that you can see on Ancestry.com as I was trying to figure out who uh, Rebecca Posner was. Um, so that's census records, uh, birth, death and marriage records, um, city directories. Uh, I certainly will look at the police court records at some point. Those have all been microfilmed, but you you know have to go in person to to look at those. So certainly we'll look at uh, police court records. Um, certainly we'll try to get to the to the uh, bottom of uh, Rabbi Levin's involvement. I think there there is the potential for some really interesting um, new chapters to be told there. Um, he's got papers uh, at U of M, among other places, so that's certainly an area of inquiry, but it is piecing together all different kinds of sources. Unfortunately, because this is before the Detroit Chronicle came into existence in 1916, that's the forerunner to the Jewish news, there's no surviving Jewish press that reported on, on this. There were um, Yiddish newspapers published in Detroit in this period. They have not survived, alas. So we're not getting um, their perspective on these events. It's all being filtered through the secular press. 
Yes, and, and as you mentioned, there are very few photographs remaining. So I know you were thrilled to find Rebecca or Becca Posner's photograph. Um, a question about the prices, did the prices ever go down? Yeah, well, I mean, in the short term, yes. Um, and I did look at city directories for Bordeloff and Markovitz and, and the other kosher butchers um, who had been there in 1910, and they were still there with their shops after 1910. So there was business for everyone. Um, it's not clear how long the co-op shops lasted because that information is not conveyed in the city directory. I only can see that that Bordeloff still has a shop, not what it is and who's supporting it. Uh, so that's a question. Um, that's a question, how long those co-op meat markets last. But, you know, by 1912, with the disruption, finally, the dismantling of the beef, um, National Beef Packing Company, then, you know, prices stabilized. So this is a short term issue after 1912, once that monopoly no longer exists, um, things, things come down. So it's a short term issue. Good questions. Um, there's a note here in the chat that Benjamin's great times three granddaughter from Alaska is on this call. So welcome Alaska and oh, welcome, that's lovely. That's welcome lovely. the granddaughter time, great times three. That's, um, that is terrific. I would be curious um, uh, to hear from the family. I know he changed his last name to Kraus at some point. And so I would be curious if you could put in the chat anything you know about um, when that happened, that would be great. Because um, interestingly, in the directories and in the press at this time, he is definitely Krakowski. And a comment here, Marilyn Stern, Benjamin Krakowski Kraus was my grandfather, had never heard of this event and found this absolutely fascinating. What happened to Rebecca Posner after the riots ended? This Got is a that. great question. This is a great question. Um, the shorter answer, short answer is I don't entirely know. Um, she turns up in the secular press in 1914 um, after just having had an operation of some, some unspecified variety. So she's 24 at that point and bedridden as she's recuperating. And she's awakened by her 10 month old niece, also Rebecca, crying. And the baby was crying because there was a coal gas leak into the house. And uh, by the time uh, Rebecca Posner woke up, the other adults in, in the home, there were seven people total, were all unconscious. So she was able to scream. Uh, she couldn't get out of bed, but she was able to scream and summon help. And so then the windows were opened and she, um, she and everybody else was, was gotten to safety. So that happened in 1914. By 1916, she was a widow. Um, I don't know what happened to her husband. I thought I had him. There was another Harry Posner uh, buried in Benet David, but that guy was 90. The year was right, but the age was wrong. So I don't know what happened to Harry Posner and I don't know where he, uh, he ended up. Rebecca Posner carried on in the restaurant that the two of them were running in 1916. She carried on doing that after he died and she was still doing it in the 1920 census as a widow. And then after the 1920 census, she disappears. So there is a Rebecca Posner um, who goes to New York, who uh, marries a Max Schulman in 1925, but that that the age doesn't quite line up there. So I'm skeptical that that's the that's the right person. But if you know if you know any Posners or Sklars, <laughs> uh, which was her her sister's married name, I would love to know if there are some descendants out there. Let Let's see who gets to the information first. <laughs> Um, have you found any evidence of similar rebellions or protests in the community in the years following, whether it has to do with kosher meat or other businesses? Yes. Yeah, so interestingly, you know, when the when the kosher meat riot was first beginning and people weren't understanding why the prices were rising so quickly, there was sort of this cascading effect to other food sources that that weren't controlled by the by the um, robber barons. So there, uh, there was pressure on the uh, bread supply. And so there was some agitation over that and the bakers were charging too high of a price. And it looked for a moment like that might go into a boycott and a riot, it did not. Um, also matzah, 
uh, at Passover the next year, there was some uh, there was some agitation over the price of matzah and concern that that might go into a riot. But nothing else that I've found so far is is anything on the scale of this one. And it's a one off. There's not ever another kosher meat riot in Detroit. This is the one. Very interesting. I, I don't see further questions. Your questions were outstanding. I thank everybody for attending and thank you, Katie, for an outstanding and interesting presentation. If any of you are not members of JHSM, we would love to have you join us for programs like this and programs in person. And um, we will we'll welcome your participation, member or not, in anything we do in the future. So thank you and good night, everybody.